So in this session, Forrest and I will be talking about the Penponte estate. And I'll start with the historical background, and then I'll hand over to Forrest, who will tell you about some of the exciting things that are happening there today. The estate is based around Penpont House, which is five miles west of Brecon on the south bank of the Usk. And by the mid-1800s, the Williams family owned around 6,500 acres in Breconshire, making it one of the largest estates in the county. Descendants of the family still live in the house today and own the remaining core of the estate. And there's an excellent collection of historic documents and estate maps, which allow us to study the estate in detail over 350 years, its growth, its interaction with the local landscape, the economy, and with people. Early histories tended to stress the role of inheritance in the growth of the estate, but actually most of the family's land was purchased piece by piece. And this process was started in the 1650s by the Reverend John Williams. Uh, this is probably him. He was the younger son uh, from nearby Abercamless House, and he'd been educated at Oxford and became vicar of Shewell and Devanagh. Now, the mid 1600s were troubled times. The Civil War and its aftermath pushed many families into debt and forced them to sell land. But John himself survived these troubles relatively well and so was able to take advantage of this fluid landmark, uh, land market. Uh, John's son, Daniel, and his grandson, Henry Williams, and, and just to make life really easy for local historians, uh, he was uh, the first of five of that name, uh, they continued this process. The farms they acquired, marked here in orange, were spread over a wide area, from Astrovelti in the south of the county to Crookhaddon in the north, and essentially they seem to be buying whatever they can get hold of. But after about 1740, any new land acquired, let's see the purple markers here, was concentrated around the core of the estate. There seems to be a new policy of creating a more compact estate. And as a result, uh, by 1840, the estate owned 62% of the enclosed land in the parish of Penpont and 61% in the neighbouring parish of Trathlong. This new policy was probably the idea of this man, Henry Williams II. He was aiming to make the estate not just bigger, but also more profitable. And he went about this in two main ways. One was to increase the productivity of the tenanted farms on the, on the whole estate. And the other was to expand and modernise the directly managed core of the estate, known as the domain. Well, let's look at the wider estate first. One of the first things that Penry did in 1744 was to have maps made of all his farms, so he knew exactly what he owned. And today these maps help us to trace subsequent changes in the landscape. Uh, here's a view of the north slopes of the Usk Valley, opposite Penpont House today. Uh, and this is an area where most of the farms were tenanted. And this sort of patchwork of fields it's probably very familiar to most of you today. And the map of evidence suggests that this view would also have been very familiar to someone who'd known the area in the 1740s. Here's one of those farms, Wern Viggin, as mapped in 1744. And here's the same farm on a recent OS map. The boundaries highlighted in red, that is the majority, are common to both maps, as is much of the woodland. But there have been significant changes, if not always visually obvious. One change is that farms have got larger. Most farms in the 1740s were just 30 to 70 acres. Over the next 150 years, many were merged into larger units, as seen here at Kevener Park in St Spudid, where four, four farms were merged into one. Some mergers predated the first detailed national maps, so the Penpont records may be the only evidence that some of them ever even existed. One driver for this change was that smaller units became increasingly uneconomic, especially perhaps when tenants had to make a surplus to pay rent. Another driver from the landlord's side was the cost of repairs. Early farm buildings were often rudimentary, roofed with thatch and poorly maintained by their tenants. 
the estate made substantial investments in new buildings, notably in the early 1800s. But the capital to do this was limited, and it went further if several old farmsteads could be replaced with one new larger unit, as in these plans by Henry Williams III himself for a brand new farmstead at Kevener Park, the, the, the farm we saw earlier. The early maps also record a large number of cottages with little or no land. Some, like these on the edge of Manishilted Common, uh, may have been created in something like the T. Enos tradition, perhaps when population pressure was high in the early 1600s. In the 200 years after 1740, the number of cottages declined drastically. And here, uh, again, building costs were a factor. The rent a landlord could expect just did not justify the cost of repair. And after the last, often elderly tenant of a cottage like this one on Trathlon Common left, the buildings were simply left to fall down. And then when the population rose again from the late 1700s, my study shows no corresponding increases in cottages, quite the reverse, in fact. Extra population was presumably being absorbed by growing towns. This slide shows the distribution of lost dwellings around Penpont. Cottages are circles, farms are squares. Over 40% of known historic dwellings have been lost. And the effect on community, culture and landscape of such a substantial loss of rural dwellings and population must have been significant. A Penpont owners also hope to make their tenant farms more profitable by introducing new farming processes. One mechanism for this was the Brecknockshire Agricultural Society, started in 1757 and still going strong today. Penny Williams II was a founder member. The society offered prizes for the best crops and later for livestock. The estate also used leases to try to ensure soil fertility was maintained by the use of lime and manures and to influence what crops were grown by tenants. For example, this six-year crop rotation seen in a lease of 1811. Moving now to the core of the estate, we've seen this patchwork of fields north of the Usk, but when we turn to the landscape south of the river, um, in 17th, um, I beg pardon, south of the river, there's a clear difference. The fields are larger, there are more trees. This land has been part of the estate's directly cultivated domain. And it's clearly a designed landscape. Some might call it parkland, but such a blanket description would mask the landscape's complex evolution. From the 1770s, Penny Williams II and his son Philip undertook a remarkable series of landscape changes in this highlighted area south of the house. In 1738, as seen on the left, this area consisted of several small holdings with modest sized fields, although it had already been bisected by an ornamental avenue. By 1794, as seen on the right, these had been merged into a designed landscape of large pasture enclosures. Features included a hundred acre deer park, a large great meadow, which was possibly a water meadow, a small lake, a string of fish ponds. There were two areas of ancient woodland which were retained, but new tree clumps were added. And this line of beech trees along the hill wall, although now much reduced, uh, is still a prominent feature in the landscape from miles away. To the north of the house, a new home farm was created at Abba Sevin, with arable fields, meadows, orchards, nurseries and a walled garden. The directly managed area of the state was increased from 150 acres to 500, and this new domain supplied many of the family's needs. Luxury foods like venison, carp, asparagus, and later pineapples, grazing for horses, timber, places to ride, walk and fish, and a beautiful landscape in the fashionable, naturalistic style to show off. And it was also a test bed for new crops and techniques which could be applied to the rest of the estate. But this ideal landscape wasn't to last. Family circumstances intervened. Philip Williams died in 1794, leaving an infant son, Penny Williams III. Philip's widow, 
had no interest in running a large 500 acre farm. And having increased to that size, the domain then shrank back to just 87 acres as seen on the right. Most of the 1770s landscape was let to a substantial tenant farmer. However, uh, when Henry III came of age in 1802, he was just itching to try out the latest ideas of the agricultural revolution. But the parkland and home farm created earlier were now tied up in a tenancy. So instead, in 1804, he created a, 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 new, um, a new home farm um, based nearby at Haberbranfach, as shown here on the right. He rebuilt the farmstead, buying livestock and an early threshing machine. And he drew up this complicated seven-year crop rotation. Oats was the traditional crop of the area, low in value, but a safe option. But Henry, Henry grew more profitable wheat and barley, reducing the proportion of oats from 62 to 39%. And to avoid exhausting the land by repeat cropping of grain, he increased green crops such as clover, and he also included turnips and swede for uh, winter animal fodder. But then, in, 17, in, in 1811, Henry suddenly sold off most of his farming stock and leased out his new home farm, reducing the domain farm to less than half, as seen on the right. We don't know why, and probably he needed to raise capital for other projects. But then, within a couple of years, he was making yet another new home farm at Aberean, south of the Usk. And during the 1820s and 30s, more land was added to make a new, even larger domain farming operation, uh, shown here on the right at its height. And this involved re-landscaping. Sorry, lost my place again. You beg your pardon. Um, re-landscaping the area east of the 1770s parkland. Once again, large pasture fields interspersed with trees were created. And once again, they have a park-like appearance, although, in fact, this was productive farmland. These new fields were divided by wire fences, a new material which I think gave a subtly different appearance from the older parkland. New picture walk, picturesque walks were also created along the banks of the Gerthid stream. And Penry's neighbouring cousins at Abercamlis were not to be left out, re-landscaping the adjoining land to the west in the 1830s. Trees and woodland have always formed an, an important part of the Penpont landscape. They provided material for use on the estate and regular revenue from coppicing and thinning. And woodland could also be a sort of family bank, providing capital when needed for projects such as new buildings. And running across the southern landscape and covering much of the steeper ground between the 250 and 350 metre contour is a nearly continuous belt of woodland which forms a sort of visual border to the landscape part of the estate. Documents show that this was actually a complex mix of old woodland, ornamental planting and forestry plantations of various dates. During the 1800s, agriculture became less profitable. Uh, between the 1890s and the 1930s, the estate's more distant farms were sold off. Later owners also reduced the area of domain farming, so that by 1991, little more than the gardens were in hand. But these areas, landscaped in the 1770s and 1830s, although now farmed by tenants, continued and continue today to make important visual contributions to the landscape. Reduced income and long-lived owners meant that there were no major changes to this date uh, between about 1850 and 1991. It became almost fossilised in time. Uh, on the one hand, this meant that some features which might otherwise have been lost have survived. On the other hand, much of the estate got into a dilapidated condition, and this has presented a great challenge. An energetic programme of renewal began in 1991, but this really had to concentrate mainly on the urgent work to the buildings and the gardens, and the wider landscape mostly had to wait. But today, as Forrest will, will shortly explain, a programme of renewal in the wider landscape is now taking shape. 
So Penpont was once at the foreground uh, of the agricultural revolution in Breconshire. And perhaps in the latest generation, it can also play a role in the green renewal of our countryside. So I'll hand over to Boris. Renanda, thanks John for a wonderful overview of 400 years of history, 350 years. I'm going to speak for 10 minutes or so about Penpont's most recent chapter, which I hope builds some, on some of the wisdom of our past custodians, but also adds some fresh ideas required to meet today's very particular challenges. Just check this one. I haven't, I haven't seen that photo in a while of the scaffolding, but I would have been there. Um, I was four when our family first moved to Penpont. And as John said, um, it basically been in a state of fossilization for about 100 years. Um, many of the outbuildings needed care, re-roofing, the house was empty, full of rats and cockroaches, uh, and quite an adventure uh, beheld us. But, um, over the past 30 years, uh, oh, my parents, one of whom's here with Gran, um, have worked tirelessly restoring um, Pempont, the core area of Pempont, breathing new life into dilapidated buildings and opening up sustainable business at, on the site. Um, I returned to Pempont just prior to the pandemic and turned my attentions and passions to the estate. Um, a place like Pempont harbours several lifetimes of potential projects but you can only take one step at a time. And seeking new partnerships is a powerful way of pooling resources, bringing in fresh ideas, and can tackle more together. So we teamed up with a charity called Action for Conservation that empowers young people amidst the climate and ecological crises. I've been volunteering with them since um, they started out in 2014. Um, and in 2019 together, we founded the Penpon Project. Pempon Project is an ambitious nature recovery initiative intertwining many disciplines from ecology, agriculture and anthropology and through working across generations, the young and the old, um, um, we are aiming and seeking to arrive what we are calling biocultural diversity. This, re this recognises that there is no true wild here, nor anywhere for that matter that we live in a, within a vernacular shaped by our ancestors and shared with many other species that call this place home too. We also recognize that we do live in a particularly nature depleted era. You may have seen the latest State of Nature report that came out a couple of weeks ago and that our current practices do not fall within sustainable ecological limits, both locally and globally. So how does the Penpon project work? Well, our project is balanced on three pillars, people, place, and processes, which I'll cover briefly here. People, our project is about meeting wider ecological and social issues, but at its core, it's about meeting the needs of the local people at Pempont and the Upper Rust community to which we belong. The project is driven by us, the current custodians of the estate, the Davis family, who tenant over 600 acres of Pempont land and a group of 15 remarkable young people, both from the local area and wider across the UK, who have formed a youth leadership group and sit alongside us adults in driving the project forwards. Alongside Action for Conservation and this core partnership, we're working with local people. Here's John, who spoke earlier, who kindly donated some black poplar trees to our reforestation program. We're on the hunt for female black poplars. If any have seen any, um, I'd really like to meet them because they're all male that we got from John. Um, and, uh, and local ecologists, um, I saw Andy King here earlier, but I think he might have gone. Um, and uh, yeah, artists and institutions such as the Banai Brachinyog National Park Authority. Um, place. Um, John has already done a wonderful job as, of painting and giving Pempont a sense of place. And as a project, we're directly responsible for about 500 acres of the estate. 
a mix of wood pasture, woodland, forestry, um, permanent pasture. And then the third pillar, processes. The how of our project rests on an eco-cultural mapping pro uh, process developed by anthropologists alongside indigenous communities around the world. In a nutshell, these maps are talking tools that help build back the social and ecological fabric of a place. Our mapping journey began with looking into the past. As Jonathan has detailed, the estate has undergone several major transformations over the last 350 years. As he said, early maps of the estate prior to the re-landscaping of the site in the late 1700s was notably more peopled landscape than today, dotted with dwellings, small holdings, wooded fields, orchards, lime kilns, and smaller farms on the land. It was probably a much more biodiverse landscape too. Old field names, now lost, give clues to such richness. Mice Drynog, the field of hedgehogs, or another translation to the field of the older an ox, another field, just to name a few. We poured over these maps together and spoke to those who have lived here at Pempont for much longer than I have, and who have witnessed and recorded change, significant changes during the last century. This work gives clues to the ecological potential of the land and breathes hope and enchantment for the future. We then took time to look at the present. We conducted extensive ecological surveys, taking the time to understand the current day farming and uh, farming practices and forestry systems in place, and spoke with a range of experts and visited exemplar projects across the UK and Wales. This work has not only informed our future plans, but through comparisons with the past, those two maps were done by the same people. Um, opened up a space to discuss the drivers of change, which can be briefly summarised here in three words, war, status and subsidy. And I tell you, there aren't many 15 year olds that I've, I know in this country who've had an in-depth and frank conversation with a hill farmer about subsidies and what happened during the 1970s headage payment era. The conversations are amazing, they are playful, they are deep, and they build incredible competence and um, confidence in the young people, and it's been incredible to witness. We mapped the future together too. This process happened over three years. Not just the future mapping, the whole, the whole kind of eco-mapping process was over three years. COVID did slow it down a bit, but it was actually quite helpful having a slow, a slow process. Um, we mapped the future together, the farmers, the young people, us, and it created a collective mandate for a greener future. This map is not about by 2050, Pempont will look like this. It's about throwing an anchor far enough into the future to give us the momentum we need to move forwards now. Lost my place again. Yeah, we, it, it's basically a shared commitment to creating a mosaic of wild spaces, regenerative agricultural practices and diversity of people reconnecting to the land. By taking the time to build our project collectively, we are now able to move quickly. Here's just some of the examples of the things we've been doing over the last couple of years with, uh, with our partners. We've planted thousands of trees, bringing school groups onto the site now, reseeding wildflower meadows, building otter holts and pine marten dens. Next week, we welcome two young people from Brecon to join a nine week paid rangership program at Pempont. Um, and we hope to do lots more in the future too. Um, whilst our project is about seeking fresh and new ideas and the involvement of young people is essential to this, we are not trying to reinvent the wheel. We must learn from the past to shine a clearer light on today's issues. I think this is what heritage means to us. I rather like what John of Salisbury had to say about heritage. In 1159, he wrote, if we see more and farther than our predecessors, it's not because we have a keener vision or a greater height, but because we are lifted up and borne aloft their gigantic stature. 
Our respect for one another today must also extend to our ancestors, past custodians of this land and water, their skills and knowledge and stories, the successes they enjoyed and the mistakes they made hold wisdom for today and we'd be foolish not to listen. Pempont's latest chapter, I hope, is an intentional inquiry into place, people and process and how we can learn from the past to envision a better future. I'd just like to end with, um, if I've got time, a poem written by one of our youth leadership group members, Willow, who's from Cardiff, who's been with us for four years and she just goes to university, I think next week now. Um, we did a sunrise vigil in August where we got 15 teenagers to get up before dawn, which was challenging, but we did it. And they sat uh, on the banks of the River Rusk um, and witnessed um, a spectacular uh, sunrise, uh, a misty sunrise. Um, and she wrote this poem during those two hours. Your land holds our hearts like dewdrops held in morning webs. The river rushes strong our blood just passing through. Bleed into the land to make rich, fruitful grounds as we pass by. It will be laden with tree, fruit and memory. Generations pass through with every moon-sun moon exchange. Stories are told time and time again. Every chirp of the sparrow, bleat of the lamb, hush of the trees comes into the rhythm of our folklore. The blanket of mist will soon rise with the emerging sun to who, who even the trees stop their whispering for. They stop and listen. Share this land as I sprinkle it in gold. Let the fog and shadow be no more. I'll kiss the morning dew goodbye and paint the sky in orange for you. There are many places for you still to go, many more things you must know. And if this takes you far from here, be free, fly the nest and spread your wings. Don't be afraid, let them hear you sing. Take up space, speak your truth, let your strength and courage grow. But this isn't goodbye, because migrating birds do come home. Thank you. Mm -hmm.